Six different Ute platforms have been confirmed as eligible and homologated for the opening season, including the Ford Ranger, Toyota Hilux, Mitsubishi Triton, Mazda BT-50, Holden Colorado and Isuzu D-Max. Series organizers revealed the first two race-ready Utes, a Ranger and Triton, at an event in Townsville yesterday. The initial vehicles have been built by championship-winning supercars team boss Roth Stone. Eight rounds have been confirmed for 2018, taking place alongside the Supercars series starting with the Adelaide 500, followed by Darwin, Townsville, Ipswich, Sydney, Bathurst, Gold Coast and Newcastle. These super utes not only look stunning but are a purpose-built race car which will be amazing to drive, is market relevant, affordable and with the highest safety levels. This will be a fantastic series to compete in and for spectators to watch, said Supercars Managing Director Matt Braid. Regulations specify a production-based dual or twin cab ute with a turbo diesel engine and rear-wheel drive, and a minimum weight of 1800 kg body styling is limited to OEM options. Super Utes mandates a control roll cage, gearbox, 20-inch wheels and tires, MoTC engine management, Brembo brakes, tilt and pedal box and Supra shock suspension as well as a common rear axle assembly with a Detroit locker differential. A series major sponsor has been confirmed, however no works involvement has been locked in from any manufacturers at this point. Roth Stone will run a team using Ford Rangers, while Sider's racing team is signed on and will campaign Mitsubishi Tritons. Super Utes replaces the V8 Ute Racing Series which features only Utes based on the Ford Falcon and Holden Commodore, neither of which will be in production next year. The latest model gains a new range topping trim, more aggressive front end design and, from spring 2018, new Propolit semi-autonomous technology. When this is implemented, the cash car will be one of the first mainstream SUV adopters for semi-autonomous technology. It will able to steer, accelerate and brake in a single lane on the motorway. At a later stage, the system will be updated and able to change lanes by itself. Nissan says by 2020 it will be able to navigate through junctions. The experience we are delivering to customers inside the cars will be calming and quieter, Nissan's Vice President of Product Planning for Europe Pons Panda Kathir told Autocar earlier this year. It is the technology that makes the cash car the game-changing car. The cash car has been a global sales sensation for Nissan since its launch in 2006 kick-starting a crossover boom which continues to sweep across the automotive industry. However, in recent years the cash car has faced growing competition from a number of other manufacturers. Cars like the Ceta Tika, Volkswagen Tiguan and Kia Sportage are providing tough rivalry, so this facelift is Nissan's chance to reassert its dominance in the segment. Upgrades to the interior of the Ford Chalifted Cash Car include a new look infotainment system and a new steering wheel with updated multifunction controls. An updated options list now includes a 7-speaker sound system, while new Techna Plus trim tops the range aimed at the growing market of premium buyers. Techna Plus gets new alloys, Napa leather seats and more luxurious materials around the center controls and it will push the cash car into rivalry with premium crossovers like the BMW X1 and Audi Q3. Engines will be carried over from the current model, 
which means there will be the same choice of 1.2-liter and 1.6-liter petrol options, as well as 1.5-liter and 1.6-liter diesels. There's also upgrades to the safety equipment available on the cash car. The automatic emergency braking now gets pedestrian detection, while there's a rear cross-traffic alert to help while reversing. The cash car currently starts from £18,795 but because of these upgrades it's expected that the price will rise for facelift. It won't be a steep increase though because Nissan will want the crossover to remain competitive in the segment, at its current price it is already slightly more expensive than the Atika and Sportage. The cash car will be built at Nissan's Sunderland plant alongside the Leaf, which is said to be replaced later this year, and Juke as well as the Q30 and QX30 of sub-brand Infiniti. Sunderland's annual output at last year's count was 507,436 vehicles. There are many firsts in life, and the lucky are able to make them count. I had never ventured into the English countryside to Lord March's estate to experience the Goodwood Festival of Speed where vehicles of every age, size, and description see who can get up the Lord's driveway the fastest or with the most panache. This year I not only witnessed the famous hill climb, but I also got to drive it behind the wheel of a 2016 Subaru Impreza WRX STI. Despite being a bit bleary-eyed coming right from Heathrow Airport after a long flight, it was an adventure to remember. Like everything at Goodwood, there are scheduled times for batches of vehicles to make the climb. They are often changed or delayed, but they bring about some semblance of order at an event that celebrates the automobile in all its forms by inviting them to a giant car show where they can be admired in motion. Our chance to make the climb is part of the Moving Motor Show on the first day, an event devoted to small fleets of vehicles from high-end automakers all staged in a pavilion awaiting the chance to snake up a 1.16-mile driveway. The Subaru fleet was there to support British Rally Champion and stunt driver Mark Higgins who competed in the timed event. Higgins was up against vehicles worth multiples of the WRX but the distinctive Hyper Blue car held its own because he posted among the best times over four days of practice runs, qualifying and then taking the third spot on the podium after the final shootout. The Subaru Group was unique in that the British saw us as sitting on the wrong side of our left-hand drive cars with Illinois plates and USA stickers on the back. Here come the Americans, the commentators cried as the first subby followed Infinities. Porsches, Autos, and others to the starting line. We partnered up, and I started as a passenger to get the lay of the land, having no experience on the narrow course line with hay bales, except for the part where one side is a flint stone wall. Throwing jet lag and the threat of rain, and we were primed. The first adventure came early, on the main straightaway in front of the grandstands, where hay bales lie across the course. Is it a straw chicane there is an opening on the left or are we supposed to go around them and keep going? We break and debate. None of the smiling road marshals provided any hand gestures or hints, so we went around the obstacle and kept going. We later learned that was the correct answer. A Ford RS200 rally car had crashed earlier, carrying too much speed for the conditions, so the hay was added to slow the cars down. From there, it was a slower but all too quick climb to the top. Time to head back down and do a driver change. That's easier than it sounds when you don't know where you are going. We followed the road until it came to a T with cones in every direction. After awkward indecision, a volunteer pointed to the left and off we went, forgetting we were in the UK until the oncoming grill of another car reminded us we were on the wrong side of the road. We quickly snuck between cones to the other side and tried to plot the rest of the course. We found ourselves in the thick of pedestrian traffic headed to the supercar paddock. An obliging Land Rover Defender even moved out of the way to let us continue, rather than point out our folly. The crowds got thicker, and our conviction we were in the wrong place deepened. Slowly we turned in the middle of the crowd. 
the obliging defender moved to let us out again, and we made it back to the proper pavilion for the driver swap. We barely noticed the faint smell of smoke as I got behind the wheel for my turn. The mist had become rain, enough to require wipers, as we awaited our turn. Launch, accelerate, navigate the hay bale, break for the turn new the course is pretty greasy now. Scrub some speed, proceed more cautiously to the top past the flint wall, and avoid all contact with stone or hay. Success and the knowledge we would not make the same mistakes navigating the way down. The smoke smell has definitely intensified. A course marshal comes running at us with a fire extinguisher. He fears it is the brakes. We don't think so. He warns us to get to the bottom immediately. We tell him that is the plan and continue on until the next marshal stops us. Do we know our car is smoking? Yes, we are on our way back to the pavilion. The pattern continues with successive volunteers. We are almost there when another helpful soul tells us the radio is cackling about a hot Subaru. That would be us, I say, assuring him we just need to go round the bend and to the pavilion. We are flagged down and told to park outside the structure where a gaggle of extinguisher wielding volunteers are waiting mustn't jeopardize the building by going inside but apparently journalists are expendable because we're told to stay inside the vehicle. We are eventually allowed out, and nothing has burst into flames. The Subaru people are not concerned. The cars we are driving have been support vehicles for rallies including the Isle of Man TT where the STI had a record lap. They have done hard miles and were pretty beat up. They figure the smoke is from sloshing fluids. Fortunately Higgins, a stunt driver for a number of movies including two Bond films, had no such issues with his 600 horsepower STI modified by ProDrive for a speedy run. Ever the perfectionist, he limited his perceived errors on each run while posting some of the best times each day. But he knew he was up against some big guns. In the end, the top podium spot went to the Jaguar XJR 12D endurance race car driven by Justin Law who did the climb in 46.13 seconds. He bested Jeremy Smith in a Chevy Penske PC22 Indy car. Higgins, in his modest Subaru, beat the Polish Aaron Hosaria supercar and the Mahindra M4 Electro Formula E in Rochecker driven by Nick Heidfeld in a hodgepodge category that included pre-war Bugattis. They know they're not going to win because they're really old cars, the straight-faced commentators noted. That is the beauty of the annual Festival of Speed. It celebrates the evolution of speed from early days to the electric supercars flying by soundlessly. Being the 70th anniversary for Ferrari, the Italian brand pulled together 70 cars from the 1947 Ferrari 125S to the La Ferrari Aperta and everything in between. They did the hill climb in a sea of largely Ferrari red to great cheers. Driving them were some of the greats, Jackie Stewart, Derek Bell, Dario Franchitti, and Mark Jean. Also on hand, Emerson Fittipaldi. The rolling stage included runs up the hill by the rally cars and drifters who put on a show for the crowd with smoking tires, burnouts, drifts, and donuts for fans of all ages. A Nissan 370, Miata, and Mustang GT spun like a pinwheel with their three noses in the center as they performed a synchronized drift in the tight course. A Land Rover made it almost to the end of the drive on two wheels as the crowd cheered, gasped, and groaned as the SUV righted itself just before crossing the finish line. Motorcycles popped wheelies and performed tricks. A few vehicles hit the hay some creating a spectacular burst of straw upon impact. A Ferrari 458 GT2 ended its run in the straw. And a NASCAR Chevy SS really had a taste for it, crashing into the site on the second turn on the first of the final day runs. The final run was even worse. 
Ed Barrier went straight into the wall, hard, on the first turn and had to be towed away, prompting jokes about what happens when a NASCAR tries to turn. There were crowd favorites such as the white Ford Galaxy with its magnificent booming engine, the Beast of Turin, which is a 300-horsepower Fiat S76 with a massive 28.5-liter four-cylinder engine that raced in 1911. Only two were built, and the one being timed on its way up the hill uses the body from one and the engine from the other. Between the roar of the engine and the flames shooting out, it was a crowd favorite. There were plenty of Rolls Royces, a Polish supercar, the Subaru 555 rally car, a Lotus Renault 971 and John Player Special Black and Gold, Thunder Saloons, the Jaguar XESV Project 8, and an Alfa Romeo Tipo B from the 1930s in other words, something for everyone.